Okay, so we'll start our presentation today. So our today's speaker is our math faculty, Professor Ranka Van Zulen, and she's going to talk about the project with students, right? <laughs> Yes, so I'm going to talk about um, a project that I've been working on um, this semester together with Jamie Buren in the audience and presenting um, his own work and with uh, Ian Sturdy, who is a, a student in the Computational Operations Research Master's program. So what are phylogenetic trees? So phylogenetic trees, I think you've all seen them before. They're trees that tell us like how species are related to each other and how they branched off of each other. Right? So you can see, for example, for these two species, the Canis latrans and Canis lupus, they're pretty similar. They branched off later than these branched off from each. Um, Here's another example of phylogenetic tree of life, and I'm not a biologist, so I can't pretend to explain really what all of these are, but we understand the idea, right? So these, for example, these two are more similar than they are to this third one, etc. So it's telling us how species evolve, basically. So what I'm interested in is how do we construct these trees? And there's one way that, um, biologists use to construct these trees, and that's called a super tree method. So the idea is that first you find a collection of reliable trees for small overlapping subsets of the species. So let's say for, for three species, you know that two of them are more similar to each other than the third one, or the third one branched off earlier than the latter two. Then you want to merge those input trees while keeping as much of this branching information as possible. So that's called the super tree method. So what I want to talk about is, like, how do we find such a super tree quickly? So in my talk, we're going to think of these small trees as being rooted triplets. There are also other examples of it, but I'm going to talk about rooted triplets. So here's a concrete example to make sure that it all makes sense. So think of having three species, species one, two, and three. And somehow, you know, the biologists, they did tests and they figured out that species one and two are more similar to each other than species three, right? So the branching off first branched off three and then later two, one and two branched off. So here's a tree that is consistent with that information. So this tree has more species than only one, two, and three, but in this tree, one and two branch off later than three branches off. So more specifically, we say that this tree is consistent <coughs> with this triplet because the least common ancestor of one and two, so that's this node here, right? You can think of this as it's the grandfather of one and two both, is a descendant of the least common ancestor of one, two, and three, which is this node, the great, great grandfather. Right? So one, two, and three, they share the same great, great grandfather. So that's the least common ancestor of all three. And the least common ancestor of one and two, that's this great grandfather here, that's a descendant of the least common ancestor of all three. So that's our goal. So as, our, as input, we're getting these types of information. And as output, we want to find a tree that's satis like, as consistent with that information. So to make sure we're all on the same page, does there exist a tree that is consistent with the three triplets written there? And I'll copy them on the board to give you a second to think about that. So we've got four species. And we're, we're giving this branching information. So is there one tree that explains how all these four species evolved that is consistent with all three of these inputs? Anyone? Yes? If you draw in the middle one a line coming off of one, 
that indicates species two? So in the middle one? Yeah, like a branch. Here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess I can draw like yeah. this. So here's one, two, three, four. Does everyone agree that that satisfies all of them? Right, so this one is satisfied because one and two branch off here, and one, two, and three here. So that one's okay. One, three, four, one and three, their least common ancestor is this node, and it's below the least common ancestor of all three of them. And the last one, two and three, their least common ancestor is this one, and that's a, a descendant of the least common ancestor of all three of them. So everyone agree that this one is okay? All right, so this one is consistent. How about this one? So can you show that you can't do it? Because I agree, I, I can't do it either. One and three on the first one are not even set uh, together, but on the second one they're joined in the same node. So, so one and three are far apart here, yeah. and here they're close. So then two has to be somewhere between them, right, because of this. Yeah. But then two and one are closer to each other than four, <coughs> right? So if I combine the information from these two, two has to be somewhere here, but then one and two are closer to each other than four, which doesn't satisfy the last one. So another way to say this is to say the least common ancestor of one and two must be a descendant of the least common ancestor of one and three. That's the first one. The least common ancestor of 1 and 3 must be a descendant of the least common ancestor of 1 and 4, so this one must be lower than that one. And the last one gives that the least common ancestor of 1 and 4 has to be a descendant of the least common ancestor of 1 and 2. But that can't hold, right? Now we have a cycle in our reasoning. So it's impossible for this one. So I want to think about that problem, I'm going to put up some notation for it. So as I'm, we call that problem the rooted triplet consistency problem, as the input we have a set of species, we call that set V, and we have a collection of these triplets. And I'll call that collection R, and it's written like this, A, B, and then a, a, a line C. So that means that A and B are closer to each other than C. So for example, here, this is, this can be written as 1, 2 is closer than 3, this is 1, 3, 4, and this is 2, 3, 4. And here, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, dash 4, and 4, 1, dash 2. So what we'd like to do is to find a tree such that we can label all the leaves of the tree by V, such that if our input R tells us that AB should be closer than C, then that is also true in our tree. So the least common ancestor of A and B is a descendant of the least common ancestor of the three of them. So here's an example of an input. Could you decide for this input whether there is a tree that is consistent with it? Becoming tricky, right? It's be, and it's not a large problem, but it's already becoming quite tricky. So what we really would like is, um, we'd like an algorithm to solve this for us, but before we can write an algorithm, we have to understand what's going on. 
And we need really an easier way to think about this. So researchers A.O. Sagiv, Szymanski, and Ullman in 1981 had this really smart idea that we should represent it as a sort of similarity graph. So I'm going to represent my input from example one as a similarity graph. What do I mean by that? I'm going to make a node for every element. So I had four elements, right? So I have one, two, three, and four. And then this is telling me that one and two are more similar than three, similar to each other than they are to three. So I'm going to make an edge between one and two, and I'm going to label it three. Right, so I'm just representing this, but in a different way. Here, one and three are more similar than, to each other than four. One and three are more similar to each other than they are to four. And the last one, two and three, are more similar to each other than they are to four. I'm also going to do that for our second example. One. One and two are more similar to each other than they are to three. One and three are more similar to each other than they are to four. And one and four are more similar to each other than they are to two. So I've got my two graphs that both represent my input. And remember that this one was consistent. We could find a tree. A tree exists. And here, no consistent tree exists. Right? Then you kind of see an argument that is different from the one we had before, that there doesn't exist a tree here that is consistent with all the information. Think of what a tree does, right? Yes? Are you asking uh, what about the second one lets you know that's not uh, consistent? Is that what you're Yes. Asking? What about this one lets me know that it's not consistent? There, was, there always has to be one node that's the furthest away, so there will always be one that isn't connected by a string. Right. There always has, that's, that's one way of saying it, right? There's one that has to be furthest away, or maybe another way of saying it is that if there is a tree that is consistent with it, then there must be some... I must be able to start the tree somewhere, right? So I have the root of the tree, and then I split off something from each other, from other things. So some things will go here, and some things will go here. Mm -hmm. But how could I do that here? So if I split off something and something else, no matter what I do, I'm going to cut through one of the edges, right? Doesn't matter how I split it off, I always have to cut one of the edges because the graph is connected. But that means that I contradict one of them, right? So if I split it off like this, then I'm not going to have one and four closer to each other than two. So you can think of the first level of the tree. It's splitting off it into two, <coughs> two, sub, two sets. But if the graph is connected, then I'm always going to put two separated that shouldn't be separated yet, right? So these I don't want to separate because 1 and 4 should not be separated from each other before we separate off 2. So basically what that means is that um, we can create a similarity graph which has a node for every element, an edge between A and B if A, B dash C is in our input. And then if the similarity graph is connected, so if there's a path between any two nodes, then we can just give up. There is no tree that is consistent with it. So let's start thinking about whether we can develop an algorithm now that we sort of have this representation of thinking about it. So 
here's our third example that I already put up earlier, which is too complicated at that time, even though it's not that big. But now we'll see that we can, we can solve this one. So I'm going to make my graph. I have a node for every element, so one, two, three, four, and five. And then I'm going to make edges for all my relationships. So one and two should be closer to each other, and the arc is three. One and three, closer than four. Two and three should be closer to each other than four. Four and five, <coughs> closer to each other than one. And two and three, two and three should also be closer to each other than five. And four and five should be closer to each other than two. Yeah. yeah. Did you mean to do four, five? Four, five, two, one. Rather than four, three. So three, four, and one, that should be four, five, one. This one? Yeah. So I should have done it should be four, four five, one. Um, one. Thanks. All right. So how am I now going to construct my tree? I'm going to start with the root, everyone is still together. And now I'm going to figure out how do things branch off. Right? So these I want to keep together, and these I want to keep together. So I'm going to make one branch where one, two, and three go, and another branch where four and five go. Do I still have to worry about this now, that four and five should end up being closer together than they are to one. Well, they're going to be, right? That's going to happen. So I'm already done with this, and I'm also already done with this. So I can now erase these, because I, I already satisfied those. On the other side, one and three should be closer to each other than to four. Well, one and three are here, and four is there, so I've got that one too. Then 2 and 3 should be closer to each other than 4 and then 5. Well, 2 and 3 are here and 4 and 5 are there. So I'm already done with those as well. So my graph becomes much smaller. And now I can continue going, right? So now 4 and 5, there's nothing stopping me from separating them. So I'm going to separate them into 4 and 5. And here, 1 and 2 can't be separated yet, but 3 can be separated off. So 1 and 2 go here, and 3 goes there. Once I've done that, I've satisfied this one, and then I can again separate the last two. So what I do is I draw the graph, I find the components of the graph, those are my separations, then that that makes me already satisfy some of the edges so I can remove them and then I can keep going. Let's do the last example as well. Four. One, two, three, four, five. One and two are closer to each other than four. One and three closer to each other than two, two and three, closer than five, three and four should be closer than two, and one and three closer than five, mm -hmm. and two and four should be closer than five. Two. Did I do it right? Two and the, f the last one, two and the four. Oh. Okay, so I'm just going to get started again. This one I can separate off. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. I'm going to start off here. One, two, three, four. And here's five. Then this edge here that says that two and four should be closer than five, I've satisfied that, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. Same here, 1 and 3 should be closer than 5, I've done that. And 2 and 3 should be closer than 5, I've done that. Oh, 
What can I do now? So I'd like to now keep going here and branch off something out of one, two, three, and four. But I can't, right? No matter how I now separate off some part of one, two, three, and four, I'm going to contradict one of my information pieces. Okay? So for example, if I were to take <laughs> three and four here, then it would not be true that one and three are closer to each other in the tree than they are to two. So I can't go on. So no consistent tree exists. We can now write an algorithm, right? Can you guys do this? Everyone taken a programming course? I think so, right? Like it may not be the easiest thing to do, but if you worked hard at it, I think you could, right? Yeah? So Jamie did this and it was, it's not the easiest thing to do and Jamie found a really nice implementation of it. But so the algorithm is the following. So we start at the top of the tree, and we're going to, in each step, partition the nodes into subsets. So we create this similarity graph. Then as long as there's still something left to do, so while one of the sets still has more than one element in it, like here, then we check, does the graph have a single connected component? And if so, then no consistent tree exists and we can stop. And otherwise, we can split it up further, we update the similarity graph, and we continue. So that's basically what I showed you here, but now in sort of pseudo code. And you can do this nicely if you're Jamie and like, use very nice data structures and algorithms to do this. So what's the running time of this? So if I let n be the number of elements, and R be the number of triplets that I'm given as information, then it was shown that you can implement it with this running time. All right, that's a very ugly looking formula. So all we need to worry about for today is that we could have R, what is R again? R is the number of triplets that are part of our input, right? So it's saying these two are closer to each other than this third one. There could be N choose three of those, right? Right? For every two, three, we could be told these two are closer than that one. So that can be pretty large even if we don't have that many species. So what we were thinking about is this problem that we call the dense rooted triplet consistency problem. So dense means that for every three species, A, B, and C, we know that either A, B should be closer to each other than C, or B, C should be closer than A, or A, C is closer than B. So in that case, this existing algorithm, it's nice, but it's pretty slow. And so what we would like to do is, can we find the tree more quickly than the running time of the algorithm I just showed you? And so the algorithm I just showed you would have a running time that basically has to look at every triplet. So basically n cubed running time. So is there any hope of doing such a thing? So could we find a tree without actually looking at every triplet? So for every triplet, we're told what should be the relationship. Could we find the tree without actually looking at every triplet? And you might first think, ah, I don't think so. But then think about sorting. I think you've all seen different algorithms for sorting numbers, right? So when you're sorting numbers, you can think of that really you have for every pair of elements, A and B, you know if A is smaller than B or if B is smaller than A. So you have N choose two pieces of information, but you can still sort the element using only N log N comparisons. You don't have to look at all of them, right? You know this, right? So basically we want to do this. We want to use quick sort to do it. Of course, our problem is not sorting, so quicksort itself is not going to immediately work. So we're going to have something like quicksort. We call that quick tree. 
So just to remind everyone, I think everyone knows what quicksort is, but just to have it in the forefront of your mind, how does quicksort work? You choose an element i as pivot, and then for every other element j, you put j to the left of i as j is less than i, you put j to the right of i if j is greater than i, and then you recurse on the two sides. Right, so here's an example. We want to sort these numbers. We choose a pivot, let's say three, then one and two go to the left, and five, four, and six go to the right, and then we recurse, we choose a pivot on the left, we sort that, and then we choose a pivot on the right, let's say four, so that means that five and six go to the right of that, and etc. We have to add one more step here. Right? Okay, so our work is that we give two quick tree algorithms for this dense rooted triplet consistency problem. And the running time is much faster than the existing algorithm. So here are some numbers to convince you that it's much, much faster. If we have 10 species, then the existing algorithm would be approximately 120 comparisons. We need 34. Um, if it's 100, then we need 665, and they need 161,000. And for 1,000, it's really crazy big compared to not that big. OK, so this leads me to the first quick tree algorithm that um, Jamie came up with. All right, so um, the first algorithm is um, deterministic as opposed to the second, which is um, uses probabilities. So the general idea is you want to find a way to partition in linear time the, uh, the nodes into the left and right subtrees starting at the root. So you, your first call to the algorithm would be you give it all your constraints, all your elements E, and it would call two copies of itself on, preferably smaller, and it has to be smaller for it to terminate, sets E, and you pass all the constraints, although you don't need to look them all up. So why might this work? Um, a, B, C, a constraint. As long as you put things on the proper side of the root for a constraint, mm -hmm. you haven't not violated, you, you haven't violated the constraint yet. So as, as long as, if, if three el um, elements are supposed to end up on the same side of the root, then as long as you put them at, on the same side of the root, you're fine. The alternative is that if you have A, B, C, if A, B go on the same side of the root and C goes on the other side, you've already satisfied that constraint, no matter where A and B may end up later in the algorithm. So, in, and, um, so any rooted triplet that crosses the root, as I said, is satisfied by placing the three nodes properly. So an outline of the proof of correctness is, um, it's a pretty simple proof by uh, strong induction. You assume that a quick tree creates a valid tree for n elements. And then you try to prove that it creates a valid, uh, valid tree for n plus 1. The first step, assuming you can partition, will partition into at most a set of n and a set of 1 elements, both of which, by your inductive hypothesis, will be valid trees. And then a root connected to two valid trees is still a tree. So that shows that you actually create a tree. Showing that you still satisfy the constraints is, is more difficult. So the, the basic idea in brief pseudocode is the algorithm, if it only has one element in the set of elements V, then it just returns a leaf node. The, in all other cases, it partitions V into V1 and V2, which are the elements on either side of what I'm calling the root. Now, of course, you might be doing a recursive call further down the tree. So it's the root of whatever subtree you're looking at at the moment. And then, if that's the case, you create a new node R, which is an interior node, and recursively call quick tree on V1 and V2 to get the left and right children. It's worth noting that which side, left or right, at any stage doesn't matter. All that matters is that the placement is correct. And you return R. So then the obvious question, I mean, you can always just say partition them properly. It's not exactly a mathematical statement. So the first question is, how could we do this? So um, partitioning V can be done by assume you have two nodes, and you know they're going to end up on either side of the root. So, and so call those two your pivots. Then for any other element in V, either, um, so we'll call the element A, either A is closer to X than Y, or A is closer to Y than X. The alternative, if you got X and Y are closer than A, would be that A is on the opposite side of the root from both X and Y, which contradicts the fact that x and y were on opposite sides of the root. Since it's a binary tree, you can't have three different paths. So that gives you that. But now, of course, the question then becomes, how do you find such an x and y? 
that seems like a fairly strong assumption. So there's what becomes a pseudocode. So as you can see, it's still linear, assuming you could do the pivot selection in linear time. Because it's just run the pivot selection, two constant time operations to add them, and then a for loop through the remaining elements. Um, for those of you who have had algorithms, it's this is similar to the um, using quick sort with the linear time selection algorithm to find the median as your pivot. So the, the, the same argument for eventual running time still holds. So in finding the pivots, that's obviously the hardest part to, to figure out. In quick sort, you only need one pivot because all the numbers are either on the left or the right. There's no, it's not a two-dimensional structure. Um, for this algorithm to have big OHN time complexity, we have to find these pivots in constant time and you know, can we do that? So here's the algorithm, pivot finder. You start by taking x and y, just the first two, any two nodes, most convenient to take the first two. And then you run through all the remaining nodes. And if x and y are closer than this node A, you switch. So you replace y with A. And so I mean, it's quite short. Of course, why does it work? First, observe that there do exist elements on either side of the root. It's, it seems an obvious statement, but it's important to the correctness. So you know that either x and y are on the same side of the root, or you're eventually going to run into an a, which is on the opposite side of the root from both x and y. So once you have an x and y on the opposite sides of the root, as we saw earlier, every comparison with the remaining a will return, if I go back, x, y, a will not be true. Because once x and y are on opposite sides of the root, a is always closer to one of the two. So then you just assume, a con you know, you assume that either y is. If y is not, then you're still going to reach an a that is on the opposite side of the root. And thus, you either, I mean, if you didn't eventually get to an a, then you had an inconsistent input. So proof of correctness continued. We so once you get to the end of that, you're guaranteed to have x and y on opposite sides of the root. Proof that it's um, linear is pretty clear. It's just one for loop. So you know, it's big data of n. So then the argument, what is the actual running time? Because of course, it's not actually n log n, because these binary trees can be n layers deep. You can, have, you can split into n minus 1 and 1, and then n minus 2 and 1 all the way down. And you're doing linear work total across each level. So your worst case is still um, big O n squared for the worst possible, well, for this algorithm, the worst possible tree. But I, um, one can argue that for, for building balanced trees, which, you know, if you were building a phylogenetic tree in genetics, you'd hope that things evolved in roughly the same amount of time, so you'd hope it was somewhat balanced. Then you get what is about n log n, because h, the height of the tree, for a balanced binary tree is log base 2 and approximately. So there's the, um, all of the algorithm. And we've implemented it, but not, not run much timing tests on it. So not sure how to perform an actual test, but it is you know, provably big O HN. And we can also, you can also prove that you can never do it in linear time, because the worst case works like sorting. And so the same argument.